So I'd just like to start by asking you both um, how you got started with this collaboration. I know that you're both coming from uh, the tradition of both improvised music as well as very complex music you know, and working with ice and how if you met through that or how yeah, um, well, thanks for having us. Thanks for coming here. Uh, so, uh, the simple answer is we met at a uh, gig of the uh, International Contemporary Ensemble, the ICE Ensemble. And uh, it was uh, like a multimedia piece for like live video and, and audio processing and like antiphonal brass and balconies. And uh, I had a uh, a stunt pistol and a bunch of drums and brick and uh, metals and woods and uh, it's really true. Yeah, it, it look it on paper. <laughs> uh, but we, we met that way despite being on the roster of this group. Um, nice ensemble. Remember anything else about that game? Yeah, it was. It wasn't good. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those gigs where it's like no one wants to say that it's not working because in those situations you're. A higher gun reading somebody's notes. So it's like, all right, you know, nice, nice show. And then we're at, the, we're at the bar afterwards, and everyone's basically gone, and Levy's still there. And it's like, there's just that moment of connection where it's like, that sucked, right? You know, it's like, yeah, that did suck. Well, then what are you into? You know, and it's like, oh, I'm checking out a Derek Bailey's improvisation book, and immediately, like, okay, oh, cool. And um, he's like, on a free play improvisation book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we just kind of connected and just decided we should start playing it. That was it. So you were a little guy, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a little guy. Yeah. And I think one performance didn't even go off, so like my hand was out. <laughs> Um, so I just kind of played off of the part of the piece. Mm. Uh, but we, we were playing solely the, the role of interpreter of dots on a page written by a composer. Right. So that so that is one model of music making, for yeah. sure. And then we just started to hang out and meet up in my studio and just play. Mm. You know, and just no, no agenda. We always to share, to share sounds. Mm -hmm. And then you know, find ways to organize these things. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I also think about this a lot in my practice with interpreting, like a lot of times hyper complex, like dealing with extended techniques and stuff, which um, both do a lot of. I think um, how has interpreting things informed how you kind of create your own identity as musicians that improvise using those techniques and finding those techniques in your own improvisation and bringing that to um, good music. Uh, I maybe it's uh, it's some context slightly controversial, but I don't believe in the idea of extended technique or use that term. I think it's a, basically a classical music term. It's like instruments are played this way, and then you play them in some other way. It's just some kooky, weird thing. But there's so many. The world of music is so broad, and the way that people approach instruments is so varied. And usually, when people interface with a an instrument or technology, they have to make that instrument adapt to whatever the parameters of their music is. So, like slide guitar and blues, it's not microtonal extended technique; it's blues music on a guitar. You know what I mean? So, and I and and for me as a as a trumpet player, I came to like uh, you know non traditional trumpet techniques through jazz and through like, improvised music, not really through lock and monitoring and session. Strangely enough written, sort of European-American written music in terms of unusual trumpet technique was really, really underdeveloped. So that wasn't my way in with any of this stuff. It was more like hearing like a Bill Dixon thing or a Bevan Parker and being like, what is that? I want to do something like that. And then I found out about the other stuff later, the, the, the written stuff right, right. after. Yeah. And I find a lot of composers often take from sure. yeah. improvisers, which I think is a lot. Um, and then with building instruments, can you kind of in a way, it's kind of an open world. You can make whatever you want. Do you find that a lot of the instruments you build come more from a... Do you think you start with a percussion in mind? Is that being your main instrument? Or do you don't want to study something? Yeah. Okay, so how, how do you kind of start in terms of developing something? So then bring that into 
Yeah, next question. Um, I'll, uh, I'll arrive at the answer to that question by answering the previous question because my answer is actually quite contrasting with Peter's. Um, well, I my first engagement with music making was purely as a like, classical music interpreter at House Pathicus for a while, and then I discovered percussion and metal instruments, and so I spent a lot of time playing scales on the xylophone and playing standard movements and uh, and timpani excerpts. Um, but then um, when I I actually I ended up not going to study music um, like heavily as a as an undergrad. I went to electrical engineering school, so hardcore um, software um, design and, um, and, and circuit design and um, systems of integrating electronic uh, things, uh, but also the playing percussion um, along along the way. It's not only until I quit my uh, sort of straight ahead electronics path. I was working with Propose as a corporate. Um, Audio engineer, and I, and I left and I went back to grad school at the Sony Group and did a contemporary percussion degree. Uh, I met a, a trombonist there named Ray Anderson, who really just opened up um, shifting the way I thought about my practice. And I didn't think of myself as an improviser, so I kind of came to it late, but having the technique and sound concepts and all these, these sort of musical experiences as a classical interpreter in my pocket, and I realized, oh, I have so many things that I can say. and. Um, he said he really showed me that I can get off the page and, and what I do without something to refer to as a right or wrong instruction from the composer is equally valid, if not more valid. Um, so with acoustic percussion, I began to improvise. Then, um, sort of in parallel, something happened where I realized that, that contemporary artists, contemporary musicians were trying to learn coding and circuit design to expand their creative practice. And I said, hey, I, I already know how to do that. So I focused on um, building electronic devices like a, that I could play like a percussionist. I wanted to build a piece of software or a, a small circuit or a breadboard, but I could practice through a metronome. And I would play triplets and quintuplets over, um, over a, a metronome. So if I said uh, a metronome like horror equals 40. Percussions are so used to sitting in a small room and hitting a wood block. And eight notes, or upbeats, or half notes. So I, why can't why couldn't we bring that to um, electronics? So I kind of, with my instrument design and electronic device sound making practice, it's very much informed by classical percussion. Just that opened up to realize that. It's awesome. well, um, the other thing we we met a very long time ago at a uh, master class that you gave up in Boston, and uh, it's something you said that's really stuck with me since then. It's something maybe you've elaborated on a little bit more. With, you viewed improvisation as like, maybe at that time, um, inviting people into your space, and kind of like, opening that door. I, I can't remember exactly what you said, but I, this was sure, brilliant. Really. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I remember it stuck with me, and I, I, I can't articulate it. So something along the lines of like when you collaborate when you yeah. with another person, there's I mean, just as you said, like coming from pretty different answers to like a pretty big question. Yeah. Like with like this collaboration. Um, I think like a Venn diagram like this. Mm -hmm. There's this meeting point where you obviously met and continue to be great work. Uh, I envisioned what you said is like if we were sitting in a room, yeah. um, you would be you know, you could come in and there's certain ways that you would have to approach what I was doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I might have been talking about a duo concert I did with Joe McPhee. So Joe McPhee is uh, still around, still playing. He's a trumpet player and a uh, wind player. And he has a very, we had a, a duo. We've done a few concerts of piccolo trumpet and pocket trumpet through like huge PA systems. Mm -hmm. And he plays in a very patient way with lots of space and uh, very unhurried and you know, if, if I want to just go nuts and play some weird stuff like, for a while, I'll just he's fine. There's no there's no sense of like, well, I better be careful around this guy. Like, he's seen everything, so it's fine. He played at Coltrane's funeral, you know, or he was dead. He saw Albert Island play, and also he's he's heard a lot of stuff. And uh, that way of playing this, this sort of open ended kind of conversational thing where there's just giant gaps and there's not really like uh, periods anywhere. That's not really my like way of playing. Sure. 
But playing with him, it's almost like he, he kind of like teaches me some vocabulary in that language, or he shows me around this room that I'm not familiar with. And what's cool about that is after a little while, I get a taste of it. So now that's part of my vocabulary, because I like it. I mean, if I didn't like it, I would incorporate it, but I like it. And so now like when I'm playing with somebody else, I can kind of like show them around this space a little bit. I think the idea is like thinking about all this stuff in terms of physical space, like that metaphor is, is, is interesting. Like one of my roles as a musician is to be able to, I would love to be able to play with pretty much anybody, as long as I'm willing to play with them. Because that's, you have to have, that, they have to be willing to do that too. So like, uh, finding people who might come from a different musical tradition and then just to even agree to be in the same room together and find a way to make music, to me that's that's very interesting. And, and always each encounter strengths and you always take something from the other person, you know, whether you want to or not. So it changes you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're excited about it. If you're if you're into that, then you're like actively seeking out people that play ways that are maybe not the way you measure yourself playing, then you keep going. And I imagine especially some of your instruments I think one trumpet's usually too many yeah. already, so it's not, it's not like Joe, I mean, Joe's trumpet playing is very, very interesting, kind of futuristic, and maybe that's why I like it so much, it's just not, it doesn't sound like some normal, it's some other language, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, have you, have you heard this theory from Peter before? I have not. Yeah. Because I, I wonder, it's like, with, with these kind of things, like, like I said a minute ago, it's like, you can play with someone redefine the way you think about how you even approach how you think about the person. Do you find that things that you've discovered together as a duo have now I imagine have changed you and how you improvise maybe in a solo setting or with someone drastically different than how you improvise for a nice person? Yeah, man, for sure. I've learned from it, I've learned a lot. Um, particularly with Electronics design, and one of the hard things with, uh, with electronic sound is the connection to the body and the sort of immediacy of a movement and an action, you know, like this or that. That's, that's, I mean, these are simple systems, right? But we know what made the sound and why it happened and how one can repeat that in a certain way. But um, when I write a piece of software or, or build a circuit, that those kind of parameters are, are sort of broken, disconnected from a system. So in terms of hitting something like a woodblock or hitting a button, that button can do whatever whatever I program it to can make any sound. That woodblock is going to sound that way, uh, which is amazing. So that I, then with its constraints, I can I can change around it. I can play the woodblock quietly, mellowly, in a fierce way, uh, fast, slow, etc. But with that button, um, it's it's a huge question. What 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 sound does it make? Is it loud? Is it quiet? So playing with um, someone that's playing on such a like a sort of simple closed system such as the trumpet really pushes me to adapt my my software response and my electronic design. So I think that um, like improvising with an acoustic um, virtuoso, it's it's influenced my uh, electronic design great. And I play etudes on my 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 joysticks and my my laptops and buttons in a way that. Uh, uh, an acoustic instrument. Right? Cool. Um, I think we have uh, uh, a particular one today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. So, Let me do one thing really quick. Yeah, I got some announcements. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a long list. <laughs> it's a business for us. All right. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, anyone? Yeah. Um, welcome <laughs> to tonight's performance of Levy Lorenzo and Peter Evans here at Leeds Motion Studio at Center Club of Arts Media. Please note, smoking is not permitted. Put them out um, in the audience or adjacent exit ways. Um, also, note the locations of the emergency exits right back there. Um, you have your choice. Located at the rear of the studio, in the event of an emergency, please gather your personal belongings, exit in Northern Manor, and gather to where the celebrity came in until the emergency uh, responders arrive. Uh, turn off your cell phones, please. No photography, video, recordings of any kind are permitted. Um, if applicable, please be aware that this production is destroyed. Or doesn't 
I'd like to make a few thank yous. So first of all, thank you to Dana Carwas, Justin Berry, everyone at C-Camp for letting me do this. this is... I'm so thrilled to be able to I mean, bring you all my heroes and just amazing musicians to this place. Um, a real honor. Um, special thanks to Chris Muir and Caitlin Fox, who have been helping me very closely with getting you know, everything you see here together, um, making the programs, making the flyers that I think look really excellent. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Matt Lefebvre, Conrad Kaczmarek, um, as well as Jack Neese and, um, for lending a lot of electronic equipment, helping with the board. And as you can see, it's an octophonic setup, it's like weird to shift the space and get everything grabbed the right way. Um, Kevin Zatina and Miguel, Percussion group, I'm mean, a lot of this percussion group you see here is a huge help. Um, and I think we're lost. Yeah. yeah.